you can get all the world's financial market data after about 15 minutes for free. So all of the value is somewhere between time of zero and 15 minutes. And you probably would have guessed it, most of the value is closest to T0. And so the idea for PIP was, why don't you try and optimize for this tiny little sliver where the data is super, super valuable and get it so that the most valuable component of that is being brought on chain, incentivize people so that there's one specific blockchain developed just for this, and then be able to expand to other things. This episode is brought to you by Das London, Blockworks' number one institutional crypto conference where all the top institutions and people in crypto are gonna be this March in London, what's becoming maybe the crypto hub of the world. I have a link in the show notes where you can learn more and also a discount code that will get you 10% off. Click the link, find out more, and I'll see you there. Everybody, welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Mike Cahill, who is the CEO of Doro Labs and a contributor to Pith. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Garrett. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm pumped to have you on. It's kind of a wild day today. Today is February 6th, and we'll get into later why it's a bit wild. But today on this podcast, we're going to talk about Pith, which Pith is, if you don't know, one, you're probably living under a rock. Second, <laughs> it's the leading Oracle provider in crypto. I think a lot of people just don't know that Oracles are the linchpin of crypto in some ways. And I want to get into that today. But I think a really good place to start it's just talk about like, why is data valuable? Yeah, there's there's going to be a point in the future, I think, where we look back at people giving away their data on the internet, the way that they looked at indigenous populations giving away the gold when Europeans discovered it. So back in the begin- dawn of the internet, people didn't really value data. And at different points in time, that value realization has struck like a light bulb to different um, different people. So like companies realized it pretty early on, like, oh, I can target advertisements. And then over time, different groups have realized it. Right now, it's pretty fair to say that like almost everyone realizes that data is gold um, or oil, but they don't necessarily know if their data is gold or like they don't know how they could keep it. And so there's still this like big question mark as to like, well, it's valuable, but it's is it mine? Is it valuable or is it only valuable if it's bundled together? And so there's all kinds of question marks about it. So let's let's dive into a particular type of data that has been really valuable for a long time. So financial market data. When you think about like um, trading, you need to have market data in order to be able to interact with an exchange. Um, and the market data is defined as the bids and offers with which traders want to trade with one another and the prices where they just executed. So if you're in any market, so in the grains market, in order for you to understand that that market is relevant is that you have a bid and offer that's live and you have some recent execution. You say, okay, this is a good test that this is a, the real price of data. If it's just something that's in, entirely indicative um, or if it's a derived price, then it's not going to be all that useful. So um, as the markets became electronic uh, throughout the internet in the 90s, the market data component of the execution and the revenues for exchanges has grown considerably. And so today it's about 20% of the value um, or the revenue composition for the large exchange. Six largest exchanges make about $7 billion a year selling just market data. And the thing about that that is sort of unusual is that the largest traders in that contribute the largest amount of market data, but they end up being the largest consumers of it. And so you can think about an analogy of this as saying like, you know, imagine that Seinfeld was creating the TV show Seinfeld and they were distributing it on NBC, but they weren't getting paid anything for it. In fact, they had to buy something back from him. They had to buy a membership service to be on NBC. And then NBC sort of like lets them do product placements. You know, you can put Coca-Cola here and they can sell it and they have a side deal. Because that's sort of how Instagram works today, right? There's this whole sort of realization that, oh my God, I'm a publisher if you're a big content creator. So that realization for the contributors of the financial market data has been been emerging for a long time. And it was really one of the foundational components of why the Pith Network was created. And we'll, we'll, we'll probably get into some of the specifics of it, but um, you know, I just want to underscore with one particular example that you know, financial market data has been valuable for a long time. Today, it's worth billions of dollars. It's 20% of the, the value of the exchanges. And now we're starting to see other components of data that people realize have lots of value to them. Is that same dynamic happening in crypto today where you were talking about exchanges and TradFi? They're making about 20% of the revenue from market data. Is that happening with exchanges like Coinbase, Binance, and others? No, it's not. And it, it's really interesting because um, the, 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 the rational person would think that that would happen really quickly. But the reality is that that's only something that can happen 
if you have relatively low competition. So in certain markets, like the US equity market, there's about 15 exchanges. Um, and there are rules that make it so that you have to kind of trade on all of them. But it's not really about the rules that make it that you have to trade on them. It's more about there's a sufficient amount of liquidity that like large traders are incentivized to trade on all of them. And so you can actually figure out ways of getting, you know, market data at, at kind of more reasonable prices through some of the smaller exchanges, although you still end up having to pay a huge amount for the large ones. So when there's high consolidation or very monopolistic looking markets, there's really high bearish entry. Futures is the market where there's almost no competitors. The CME is the futures market. And there's there's really not no one that competes with them, at least not in the US. And actually has that profile around the world. And in Brazil, there's the B3 markets, and it's just a singular uh, market. They actually own the clearinghouse as well. And so you end up having really consolidated um, kind of markets that end up being this winner take all. So we know this is a big market. It's highly valuable. Now we have crypto, which is all about data. There's this whole MEV market. There's a lot there. Um, I want to get into what PIF is, but I think a good part to start would just be what is the Oracle problem? Why, why do we even need oracles in crypto? Yeah, the blockchain solver the state, right? Like the state of the network at any given point um, is distributed amongst the validators and anything external to that or exogenous to that needs to be brought in somehow, right? It's not native to the blockchain, so you need to update it. So in the case of a loan, you need to know the value of the collateral that needs to be brought in. And that's where trust is paramount, right? So anything exogenous, you need to have similar mechanics to the way that you have the mechanics of either proof of work or, or proof of state where you cannot have that be gamed. And so that's what an Oracle network is designed to do. Um, now, there's different types of Oracle networks. And the first ones were really designed to solve for trust, but they didn't optimize for speed. It was very generalized. And a lot of the assumptions around the availability of that data was that you can go and grab it from the open internet, right? As long as the internet's been around, one of the core theses or attributes of it is that data has just been freely accessible. And part of the reason for that is that most generalized data is incentivized to be open because of how Google is structured. So basically, if you go on the internet and you're a business, you have a website, you're incentivized to make your data public so that it could be crawled by Google and Google will route traffic there. And then the more traffic you have, the higher you can, you can sell the data um, and you can you know, sell advertising for. This model all breaks though. Um, now that we've got large language models and ChatGPT. ChatGPT does not tell you where it got the data. It doesn't pass through any of the traffic to any of the websites. So not only is that a flawed assumption to start with, it's one that's going to get worse every month and year that goes by due to the fact that less and less traffic is being routed through Google and its traditional business model. And so the, the thesis around PIP was to create a source of trust at very low latencies that doesn't depend on sort of a shaky foundation, doesn't depend on the business model of Google making the world's information freely available. Yeah, it's a huge part of crypto that I think the average participant doesn't notice. And it's, it's a good thing they don't notice, right? Like they shouldn't be thinking about these infrastructure layers and where these oracles come in. And we'll talk about your airdrop later. I did think it was funny when you were talking about it. You said 50% of the recipients of the airdrop probably didn't even know what Pith was because they just interact with apps, <laughs> which then leverage Pith, right? And I think you're on 50 chains and 300 50, plus. 50, 50 different 50. blockchains. Yeah. That is, that's insane. So you just went multi-chain, I think, over the last year. Maybe you can describe <laughs> how you launched PithNet, which then I think allowed you to go multi-chain. Yeah. So the first component of, of figuring out whether or not this was an idea that was going to stick is, is build up the supply. Because if you're going to develop something that is going to be useful for people, you need to have a minimum viable product that's, that's quite comprehensive. And the supply for Pith was rather than going to the exchanges, go upstream from them, go to the trading firms or smaller exchanges that don't currently make a lot of money from their market data and allow them to participate in the market data economy um, by publishing that data on the blockchains and make that data available. And so the, the first phase was go get the sources. Um, Pith pretty quickly got a lot of sources. In fact, today, the network just celebrated a milestone of having over 100 um, sources. And these are all big institutions, all the large trading firms and exchanges as mentioned. Um, but there was about 25 of them that created the, the core product. Then Pith went live on Solana. And at that point, you're trying to solve for, well, now that you've got all this data, are people going to be willing to use it when there's this alternative that's available and has been available for a long time, but it's slower? 
And, you know, it's probably not future proof, but people don't tend to care as much about not being future proof until it's an actual problem. Um, and pretty quickly, Pith dominated on Solana from a usage standpoint. So seven months in, Pith had over 90% market share, and it's it's remained at that position. Now, the idea was always to be the, the oracle for all blockchains. Being on Solana was something that allowed Pith to engender trust with this network of trading firms who obviously do not trust each other. <laughs> They're trading against yeah. one another. They need to understand that it's a protocol, that it's open sourced, that you can investigate it with a block explorer. So using a public blockchain was an important decision at that point to show that there was, you know, no cards up the sleeve of the magician. You know, this is fully open source. These are tools that are available to anybody. Um, but it does need to be at the fastest block times in order to be able to be at the fastest block times on any other slow exchange. And so from that perspective, it was a very easy decision that, you know, we had to go with Solana. Um, now when we're going cross chain after we'd sort of proven that, okay, you know, people want to provide prices, people do want to use the prices Well, people are going to want to use this on, on other chains. This was at a time where two things were happening. Number one, Solana is becoming really popular. And number two, for things other than what we're planned for. So, um, but Solana was becoming popular initially because it was allowing high throughput DeFi, but then without my expectations, it became really popular for NFTs. And during the mints, it was the worst you know, environment to be able to be publishing something that was um, taking up 50% of the block space because everyone was using spam bots to try and, you know, win the mints. And it was just a really, really difficult in environment. Was this like 2021, Mike, like around the summer there? Like early, end of 21, early 22, when things started really becoming more of an issue because you started to have some of the downtime. And it's tough when you have it once and you say, you know what, we trust the, you know, the core team around Solana. It's going to get better. We're very early. This is a great problem, right? If, if you've got a couple hundred thousand people who are, who are actually doing stuff on DeFi, but then you, from time to time, get a million wallets who are trying to do something all at once, that's great. That's great for the, you know, the evolution of our industry, but it's not great if you're dependent upon it. So we had this sort of, this is really exciting, but it's also incredibly scary. And the first time, you know, we we're like, well, we fully trust Solana. And then the fifth time was, okay, we certainly trust that Solana is going to fix these problems, but when, and we have an issue now where it needs to go cross chain. So Pith actually created the first SVM, PithNet, where the Solana code was forked. There are some modifications that were made. So you don't have the, you know, for instance, the gas token, it only allows for the Pith application to run. It gets validated by the publishers. So you have the same kind of decentralization characteristics that you have on Solana mainnet. And it was plugged into wormhole and gave Pith the ability to now connect to the rest of the universe. And so that's where things got super interesting. So I'd say the start of 2023, Pith was effectively on Solana. By the end, it's on 50 blockchains. And the journey was just a crazy, crazy sprint to many different blockchains, hundreds of applications, you know, millions of transactions per day going to other chains. And it's just been a wild, wild ride. Yeah, it's insane to see the, the shipping that's come out of Pith. I'm curious, when you do all these integrations with these apps, do you have to do anything on the Pith side or the apps onboard themselves? So Pith is permissionless. And so if you want to use Pith prices, you actually can just use them. And that's a unique characteristic that, um, you know, we at Duro and the teams that are building on Pith fully believe in. We think that it's necessary for infrastructure to be accessible to everyone. We don't want to have a contact sales to, you know, use Pith anywhere. That's a that's a broken business model to us. That that means that you don't get to um, appreciate the economics that are built into blockchains, and so you're basically trying to retrofit like a web two services business on the blockchain. And so that's like the antithesis of, of what we would want. So it's entirely permissionless. The economic model is built into the protocol itself. Um, Pith has a pull mechanism where prices, which are all generated on PithNet, are not effectively useful on other chains yet, right? So PithNet is only running the singular application Pith. And um, on the 50 blockchains, if you want to use one of those prices, you actually have to pull it onto that blockchain. Now you can pull it on the, the PithNet speeds. So since it's going to be faster than most of the other blockchains, you're always going to be at the fastest times, um, but you're going to pay a small fee for that. 
And that's the economic model where it doesn't matter if you just go and take the prices. So long as you're, you know, using the protocol pr correctly, it should have the economic, you know, uh, value chain such that the owners of the IP that published initially are actually rewarded at the end of the day. That's the ideal behind it. Deploying on new blockchains, though, does require some work. But, um, but once it's deployed there, anyone on that blockchain, anyone building on that blockchain is able to pick up PIP prices without contacting anyone. Gotcha. That's very cool. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event I promise you don't want to miss. It's BlockWorks' biggest and best institutional conference called DAS London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March. Where we're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers, and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions, and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real-world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing. And then we have things like DeepEnd happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space is going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user, or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 10% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 10 when checking out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. I want to double down on the publishing themselves, who are also the validators, it sounds like, of PipNet. I'm curious, why are they providing this data? Why are they a publisher? And then also, how do you vet them and assure that they are providing good data? And for somebody that's new to oracles, like a very simple oracle is you could just have CoinGecko. And if you're Aave, you just interoperate with CoinGecko and you pull that price for ETH, right? And then you could have an oracle network where let's just say it's 10 oracles and they're all pulling from CoinGecko and reporting that price to the Oracle service, it just averages them out. Well, it's all the same source, so it's the same price, and they report that to Aave. But that's not actually redundant at all, right? It's pulling from one source. So how do you ensure that you have these different data providers that one, it's just not all of them pulling from some source like CoinGecko, and why are they providing it in the first place? The um, why are they providing it goes back to the economic value um, chain that I kind of described in the beginning. So there's $7 billion of revenue that's captured in financial market data. And none of that is being captured by trading firms who end up creating the most. You know, this is your classic dilemma of the creator economy, um, where the largest YouTuber is getting paid nothing in this scenario. And so you have all these trading firms who effectively have this found resource, this found oil that to them is, is it a commodity that's collecting dust that are now for the first time able to try and um, generate a yield on it. And so that's really the, the core thesis that excites all of these publishers. You know, there's something that they've never used before. They know there's value to it. This is a protocol that allows them to, um, to generate the value from it. Having each one of them be independent from one another is incredibly important as well. So um, if you're relying on a singular source, but you've got many other sources reporting it, which is the kind of the traditional version one of Oracle's um, model, it gives you the illusion that there's redundancy. But then as soon as you have the, the um, CoinGecko price go down or coin market cap, which actually did go down, I think two years ago, you had a bunch of problems with those gener first generation Oracle's. Um, you create these halls of, halls of mirrors, right? So if you go on to certain like Oracle websites, you'll say, here are our, our Oracle publishers. And there are no name companies and there's like hundreds of them or, or dozens of them at least, but they're basically automation firms and they're running like a staking service and they just run a specific software that was given to them. And it's pointing to a specific website. And the idea behind that is if you have 10 people who are reporting the information from a single single website, it's very easy to filter out which ones are, are incorrect because everyone's supposed to be saying this, the same thing. The idea with Pith was let's try and get people who know the price independent from one another and incentivize them to publish it. And then you can create a composite rate that has much more value to it or much more information in it. So the way that that's constructed on Pith is you have each publisher publishing a single price as along with a confidence interval. And all of the prices and confidence intervals get aggregated at every block on chain to create a composite price and confidence interval. That tells you that the price of Bitcoin is 42,321 plus or minus $11. Um, at the next price update, it might be plus or minus $30.
And that dispersion amongst the price is meant to tell you that there's disagreement or opportunities to arbitrage amongst the exchanges or different traders. Um, and that's just how the world works, right? Like there's no singular price at any given point. There are times where there's high consensus when there's low volatility, but during high volatility or during some sort of an extreme move or event, you tend to have these opportunities where there's just disalignment between the different exchanges. Um, one classic example is when you've got strong currency controls in places like Korea, where they have kimchi premium, the like, upbit will tend to trade at a premium or a discount to, say, Binance often. Um, and it's just because there's no fungibility between that currency. But that should be represented. That's like real information. You shouldn't just ignore it and say, okay, well, we'll just take the average. Um, there's actually much more valuable information that you can extract by putting that all on chain. And so this is where governance could come into play as well, right? Which I think at, at the moment or up until the airdrop was done by the PITH contributors themselves. Because the, the difficult part is like, when do we add a new price feed? Because you might have a new application. It's like, oh, we want to trade Pokemon cards now. We need like a price feed <laughs> for Pokemon cards, right? But it's like, is there an actual price that you can grab? And is there multiple prices? Because like you said, if you're relying on one and that price feed goes down or it's manipulated, you have real problems there. So maybe let's just jump ahead a little bit. I'll, I'll summarize that you guys announced an airdrop back in November. You actually did an airdrop. Uh, I think it went to over 90,000 wallets across like 40 chains, probably the most expansive airdrop that we've seen in crypto yet, which one, congratulations. It's absolutely Thank incredible <laughs> and awesome for the team. That does introduce the idea of governance here. So maybe if you can pull those two together on how you actually determine like when you're adding new prices that you'll provide a, a, at Pith, and then also does governance come into play on that yet? Yeah. So the intention for that airdrop was to invite participants in the into the community who um, were users of Pith, even though they probably didn't know they were. Um, so it was inclusive of, as you mentioned, 40 blockchains, um, users of applications that are powered by Pith. The idea there is, um, you know, this is a decentralized piece of infrastructure. It can enable more versions of the applications that these people are using. You know, they should want to have a say it's a little bit like having a say in NVIDIA if you're like a phone user. Um, you know, maybe you want your chip to be a little bit faster or maybe you want it to be able to empower certain um, other applications that you'd like to see in the future. Now, that of course implies a certain level of expertise. And so this is where we're going to get into some of the limitations around governance and where you want to make sure that those trade-offs are set given where we are in the state of crypto in general so that you don't end up um, seizing up the potential to move very quickly. So the airdrop was claimed by over 50,000 wallets. And um, today there are 150,000 wallets staked in the protocol. So um, <laughs> that, that's a huge result. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it just shows that there's tremendous amounts of appetites to stake, to participate in governance, and to, you know, understand that this infrastructure is so necessary among so many different people. Like 150,000 to maybe somebody who's used to Web2 numbers may not sound like a lot, um, but just to give you some perspective on that, on Aave, there's about 15,000 wallets that are staked. Um, on GMX, I think there's 30,000. On Synthetics, there's 40,000. On Solana, there's 225. So like 150 for a protocol that just did an airdrop like two months ago is, is, is pretty, pretty big. Um, and that, you know, that's, I think, partially just from the fact that it's so foundation foundational to so many people. They, you know, they were able to understand like, okay, cool. This is something that other applications are going to need. And so I want to, you know, have at least a look at how this is going to work. So phase one of governance, we actually have the vote is going live today. There's a proposal that was pushed, pushed forward, um, is on the constitution. Constitution is a representative governance where there's two primary councils. There's a Pythian council, um, and then there's a pricing council. And having representative governance like this. Synthetics has done this. Um, Arbitrum and Optimism have done something similar as well. Give the ability to operate quickly. And so if you end up doing everything in a one token, one vote, it's very quickly becomes a plutocracy. Um, and also it just doesn't move very quickly, right? Look how fast Ave moves. It's, it's, it doesn't need to move quickly because everyone's sort of comfortable with, you know, the primary um, functions of it. But if it wanted to, or if people wanted it to, to be much more dynamic, it would, it would have a tough time given its current governance structure. So this allows core contributors from this wide ecosystem of users, so publishers of applications that are using prices, of some of the development teams that are contributing, to be able to move quickly. 
get new prices in all the time, run conformance testing on new publishers. If somebody fa fails conformance testing midweek, be able to communicate with them that they need to go back through it before that they're added into a, a particular symbol. Um, all those sorts of things that you know you expect to have happen on a fast pace kind of piece of infrastructure that's growing as quickly as as the ecosystem is, you know, being at 50 chains today, hopefully at 100 chains at the end of the year means that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And yeah, Mike, you've said that you want all the financial data that's on chain to go through Pith. That'd be absolutely incredible. It's a big responsibility. And I think that's one reason why you actually have your own SVM um, app chain, if you want to call it that. Today in Solana, there was a few hours of downtime, which is the first we've seen in, I don't know, months. It's been probably almost a year. That obviously causes a lot of issues for the DeFi protocols built on top. You not only have, say, Solana DeFi protocols relying on you, but multiple chains, 50 plus. And then you have applications on top of that relying on your oracles. And if an oracle freezes, if... Pith goes down and then six hours later it comes back online. Those prices could be massively different, which leads to liquidations, et cetera. So what are some of the things that Pith does to help prevent that, to reduce maybe that liability that you guys have from maybe just the app chain perspective? And then also something that you use is wormhole. And I think wormhole is actually how you send these messages between chains. Yeah. So Pithnet is a singular environment and um, knock on wood has not gone down. <laughs> Um, so it's isolated from Solana and during Solana's downtime today, none of the other chains that Pith's connected to had any sort of exposure. Um, that has been the, you know, the kind of the, one of the core theses around why it was built is it needed to be in an exclusive environment so that it could be troubleshot without having to be bundled together with other applications. It's such a big piece of infrastructure. It's so widely used cross chain. Um, it's really important that it has its own blockchain and its own set of dedicated validators and, and kind of contributors. And so that allows us to effectively be isolated from, from kind of Solana downtime. The other element of it is on, on the wormhole side. Um, so Pith uses a version of wormhole where it's just on the message passing. So it's not on a full wormhole deployment um, where you've got like, say, token bridging. You know, wormhole does quite a bit of stuff. Um, so it's a one-way broadcast. It's actually not even a two-way messaging. So it's a very light version of the kind of the wormhole software and protocol. Um, so those are really the things that um, give us the, the the foundational. And there's stuff that's built on top, which is everything from you know the monitoring to kind of redundancy, um, failbacks, all those kind of standard good practices um, that our engineering team puts in place, and dry runs of testing. You know what would happen if certain things go down. Um, that you know, we have to keep keep doing to make sure that in those environments, should they come, you know, we can be up as fast as, as possible. Because you say it's incredibly important if you're relying on an Oracle to avoid things like bad debt um, to make sure that you've got that liveness. And, and we've been able to represent that and demonstrate that um, throughout the PithNet history. And so, you know, it's something that we have to make sure that we continue to take serious. Yeah, you guys are absolutely killing it. So keep it up. Um, Back on the data publishers a little bit, because I think I didn't completely understand that. And you were explaining why these publishers actually provide the data, and there's an economic incentive to do so. Do they get paid? Like, is there an inflationary reward that comes through these tokens that you now have, or is it all through transaction fees, or how does that work? There's an inflation reward um, that's been set in the um, in the white paper as 22% of the supply will go to the publishers. Um, how it ends up getting distributed will be up to the um, the governance to decide. Um, but that was earmarked in advance. And then the other component of that is the fees itself. So fees are currently set to one way, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, So it's the lowest update um, on every every blockchain that Pith is, is deployed on. Um, and there's about four and a half million updates per day that are paying fees. So this is going to go to proto governance as well to vote on. Um, now, the important thing to think about is where Pith is in its or where both Pith and the ecosystem are in, in their evolution and how much there is to grow. And so what I would encourage governance to think about is making sure that Pith is set up for long-term growth and making sure that it is not trying to be too extractive with setting fees too high um, in an early, early phase, making sure that we're empowering this as an, as an ecosystem and architecture in ways that other technological breakthroughs have done as well, right? So if what we're trying to do is build a financial system 
that can be profitable at fractions of the cost of the existing financial system, it always happens at the consequence of having many more people be opted into the system, right? The U.S. has got a great financial system, but that's only, you know, 350 million people. There are, you know, billions of people outside of the U.S. system that are going to be able to hopefully be opted into tier one, um, like investment opportunities in tier one kind of savings plans, insurances, all the stuff that got us excited about building in, in this crypto ecosystem. Um, and those are huge opportunities for us to be able to overcome and reasons why we can expect to have things done at fractions of the cost of what they were done at, you know, historically. Mm -hmm. Doubling down on the incentives point. So making an analogy with LSTs or liquid staking tokens, you have Lido and Rocket Pool, which are two of the larger providers in the Ethereum ecosystem. They have really two different models and Rocket Pool, you actually have to put up a deposit if you're going to be one of the validators, which is like economic security of some sort. It's kind of like security deposit if you're running a house. Whereas with Lido, that doesn't happen. Like all the stake is delegated, but it all comes down to reputation, right? Like as a protocol, they're selecting validators that they know run the proper machines, also have a high reputation. And there's an economic incentive because if you get cut off from the protocol, you're not going to get any of those future cash flows. How does Pith think about this? Because I'm assuming a lot of these publishers, it sounds like they are traders, right? So if they could, you know, get away with it, they would love to manipulate prices to help them, you know, get a higher profit. But obviously, Pith is trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. So how do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so w when I think about what Pith's mission is, it's, you know, Pith is trying to solve for truth at T0. Um, and so, you know, it's impossible to be the truth at T0. So you're so, sort of always approaching this um, kind of asymptotically. Um, right now, I give Pith about a 6 out of 10. Um, and the reasons why it's that high, which also I think is higher than any other um, any other protocol that's attempting to do anything close to this. Um, I think Pith is by far the you know the best, but it's still at only, only a six. And the reason for that is you've got these kind of institutions who are all all disclosed. You can go on the website and see who's publishing, um, and that gives you an idea on how to sort of risk weight that group, right? So you can see which trading firms are there, exchanges. Um, and you can determine like, okay, based on this pool, I'm going to pick the lowest common denominator and assume that they're going to be everywhere. You know, what is this going to look like? And each one of these publishers obviously is publishing a, a price and a confidence interval. So that gives the aggregate the ability to um, weed out outliers a little bit better. Um, it does a computational um, weighted median, um, which is a little bit more accurate than just picking saying, an, an average. And then it creates this Laplace distribution to determine what the confidence interval of the aggregate is going to be. That gives you a whole lot more information based on the distribution of inputs that you've gotten. So, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good as well. Um, and then the other element of it is the fact that there, there's a minimum number of, of publishers for each symbol. And so if you don't have that minimum number met, you're not going to create an aggregate. Um, so the average minimums, I think somewhere between five and 10. And so you've got this like up to a hundred publishers, there's 64 that can be on any, on, on any single price. So it's very easy to go on the website or to go on the blockchain and say, okay, well, how many publishers are in this symbol? And then that will give you an idea of what it would take to make that be a bad price, right? So if there's 20, okay, let's just say that um, forget about some of the um, the control mechanisms in place. The bad price needs to come at like 11 bad publishers. And um, and it would be very obvious. Like the other element of people's misunderstanding around things like why did LIBOR have bad pricing is that LIBOR had, had um, this opportunity for collusion and for manipulation because there was no way to check it. Like LIBOR was being created out of thin air and it was the source. Whereas what Pith is doing is actually creating something that is infinitely checkable after any sort of time, right? It's just trying to be the fastest to do it. But you can wait one minute and, and find out very quickly if Pith was lying or like the Pith price was wrong or it wasn't wrong. So it's almost impossible to hide a manipulation on Pith. Like it's going to become the most obvious thing. And then when you look at it, you say, okay, well, who are the 11, you know, contributors that manipulated it? And what did they do with that manipulation? And then it's all on chain, right? Because the only, the only protocols that are actually using Pith are going to be on chain. And then you're going to say, okay, there was a big liquidation event that happened. And, you know, this person won the liquidation reward. Okay. Well, what did they do with that reward? So it's pretty far fetched to be able to take all this. But again, that gives us a six out of 10. So how do you improve from a six? Well, then you start to add things like staking. And so I think that's a really important component of this that I would heavily advocate for. Um, so I love the idea of things like micro slashing, 
where each of the publishers have to post some stake. And if they are like, um, let's say they're blatantly latent. And like one thing would be like a free rider problem, right? Like if you reduced the quality right now, you know, you've got pretty high quality to become a publisher within the network, but let's say that you reduced it a little bit and you say, you know what, maybe there's some people out there that have great data. Um, one thing you could do is if you wanted to try and manipulate the system, you say, all right, well, I'm going to go take the fifth price and replay it back to it and, um, you know, earn some rewards on that. So you can check for that and say, okay, let's say that you have got some delay function on like the output of the pith price or just one of the publishers, you're going to be penalized for that. And what would be cool is if you have this stake and then you use like penalties come in the form of like micro slashing and then you fall below the required stake and you go back into an auto conformance mode. And so you actually make it so that it's never profitable for someone to be like a bad publisher. And likewise, if you have like the most predictive of the publishers get the highest percentage of rewards. So if you can see it like some decay or some delay function, who is going to be the most predictive um, as opposed to have it be stake weighted or anything like that, you just say, okay, you're the most accurate. And so we're going to give you the highest percentage of whatever the reward block is. Um, you end up creating these great incentives where like the best predictive contributors get the most and the ones who kind try and come in and manipulate the system get the worst. So stuff like that, I think is, is really cool and, and, and we'll be able to hopefully bring us up from a six to a higher number. Love that. And I love the honest assessment with, with the six, which I th actually think is pretty solid right now. Like we're, we're so early. So that's amazing. And I, and I love how yeah. you're thinking through this. Okay. I want to get a little exploratory with uh, real world assets or RWAs and just how you think about it in general. I've seen you tweet about it. Um, I think RWAs are such a huge opportunity, but people also have to realize, and this goes back to the Oracle problem, just because the data is on chain doesn't mean it's good data, right? It's like bad data in, bad data out. And at this old startup that I worked with, we were providing loans through this software that these silos would use for traders where they'd store their grain. Okay, so like if you're a trader, you'd bring in your grain, they'd type into the system, that system was our software, and we could see where your grain was and who owned it. Those were third parties typing in that data. So we could almost trust them. It's not the trader themselves saying, I delivered 100 tons because they could be lying. It could only be 10 tons. So what we would do is we'd provide these traders and farmers loans, but we'd have to get that money from the bank. Now, how do we get that money from the bank? Well, I would take the data out of our system, right, which was already typed in by a third party, then I would look at it and the banks didn't want to see that. They wanted to see it in an Excel sheet. So then I would get that data. I would type it manually into an Excel sheet, send it over to the bank and the bank would then loan it based on that data in Excel sheet. So like what could crypto do? What could cryptography do? Somehow let's get out of Excel sheets because that <laughs> level of trust is, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is so dumb. So I yeah. want to know like, how do you think about RWAs? Where's Pith going there? And is there anything you think you'd ever do with like IoT sensors? Because that's something we were exploring. For example, like, can you prove, like if you have a silo and you have 100 tons, could a sensor prove that's there? Is that something that you guys even look at or how do you think about RWAs? Right, so there's like the near future and then there's like the kind of um, more distant future. So let's just talk Definitely. first about like the near future. So right now, Pith is optimized for price discovery for very liquid assets that are traded somewhere else in the world. And I think that you end up getting a whole lot of opportunities within just these, this category of stuff um, in the short term. So we've got 400 symbols today on, on Pith. We should have over a thousand by the end of this year, but like they'll fall in this similar sort of categories. There's crypto, there's equities, there's interest rates, there's commodities and metals. Um, and anything that you want to build as sort of a derivative of exposure to that, um, similar to way like a synthetics would like, you know, that that's all available today. Um, but let's push that a little bit further because, you know, that's what I think people refer to when they're thinking about RWAs, yep. you know, the sci-fi vision, even before you get to the IOT sensors is like, what, well, when am I going to be able to put my house on chain? Mm -hmm. Now, the reality of this ends up being around the price discovery and the derivatives of certain sets of assets that are based on certain benchmarks. So if you think about PIF as creating all these super liquid benchmarks and putting them on chain, there's always a relationship between the benchmark price and some esoteric asset. I learned this when I first started, I was at Morgan Stanley and I was on the FX desk. And whenever we would have a and in, in, I was based in New York, whenever we would have some sort of a like dollar Korea trade or dollar India trade at New York hours, the NDF traders or the, the emerging market traders 
would not be able to do anything relative to that market because it was super illiquid. There was no onshore futures that you could trade on them. So they would just take a punt on like the general risk of the system. And so they would either buy or sell S&P futures because that's just saying, all right, right now, the best I can do is hedge for the macro. And then when that market opens up, figure out what whatever these idiosyncrasies are. So that just tells you like every trader is thinking about something as some sort of a benchmark derivative that you can base it down to in the first principles. So you can do this using PIP prices because RWAs that are being experimented at banks, and we've talked to every single bank, is always around liquidity light products that aren't traded elsewhere, right? Because the U.S. has great U.S. equity exchanges. They all clear through the DTCC. It's not a broken system, you know. So the the appetite is always like, well, what can we bring on chain? And what is it like a um, currently suboptimal trading environment? And usually it's some form of like private placements of, of an LP position on something like a limited partner position, not a, not a liquidity <laughs> provider position. Um, and for those, they're always going to have some relation to some set of benchmarks. And so actually you can construct benchmarks using Pitt's price that give you an, some information on how to peg a offer from someone that wants to then make the liquidity available. And you can get in this scenario where right now, if you, you've got all the different banks have all their private clients who have a very limited amount of LP shares for sale at any given point, you can incentivize them to say, all right, look, if things became liquid enough, what price would you be willing to sell this position for? And you can create this effective order book based on a series of relative benchmarks that you basically mark to model. And so long as they you know, have the right performance characteristics of it, and then it gets updated every, every one of those trades and that becomes sort of an input into the actual pricing model itself. I think that is like the closest that we have to bringing and solving a problem for a really illiquid market on chain using highly liquid instruments that are relatives to it. So I'll, I'll pause there <laughs> and then and then I'll tell you like the, the sort of the Star Trek, you know, kind of sci fi way. Yeah, I pushed you sci fi really quickly. And I think the big thing is like we want more TVL depending on, you know, some people say TVL is useless. I don't think it is. <laughs> we want more TVL and crypto. And the easiest way to do that is to bring assets that are off chain on chain and just try to add some efficiency, right? Something that's actually useful. So no, no, no. I think you you were really helpful there. And that, that explained a lot. I don't know if you don't want to give your sci-fi case. If you don't want to give that, maybe just give, for example, where Pith would be in like five years from now from where it is today. Like what would be different? What would you want to be offering? Yeah, so I think that the financial... Um, market data segment is definitely one that's going to continue. And I think it will be expensive. It'll start to include things like um, the per square foot of real estate, which get, which ends up being a derivative that you can then price all the rest of these houses on um, in an in a, in a intelligent way that you're not doing today. Um, so I think that's somewhere that Pith can innovate on. Um, and then I think that there's this trend, which I described in the very beginning, which is why large language models have sort of reversed the course of the openness of the web to a certain extent, which will end up creating more and more private data sets, which will expand the likely um, types of information that will be available through something like Pith or through Pith. Right now, Pith is optimized for financial market data because it's, you know, multi-billion dollar industry and there's lots of people who want to monetize their market data. Um, stuff like whether currently has no like private value or very minimal private value. Um, it's currently all monetized on the internet via ads. Um, and same with like sports scores, there's like minimal value. It's, you know, it's not, it's not nothing, but it's like probably sub a billion dollars for like the high speed um, uh, access to sports scores. Um, if that were to change because of LLMs, like the real time access to data like this, um, I think that those would become very likely categories of expansion for the Pith Network because owners of proprietary data are not able to make enough money from advertisements. They can then, you know, monetize that via Pith the way that financial firms are monetizing their financial data. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of Hive Mapper, who we've had on the show before. They they have all these cars going around through doing live mapping, and one of their key things is I almost call it latency. I'm not sure what they call it, but it's how often they refresh the map. But I believe they actually sell some of that data. I don't think this is quite sci-fi, but like an example would be if you wanted to know, 
you know, back in the day, I think people actually invested in like Costco based on how many cars were in these stores. And if you had people going around actually mapping, and this is before you had drones and everything, and you could actually count those cars through these dash cams, for example, that could actually be valuable data. And that is a form of an Oracle. And it's not something that Pith would offer, but I do think there will probably be some niche Oracle services that pop up that maybe do have offerings like that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of attributes to Pith that look like DeepN, um, given the fact that it's coming directly from, you know, kind of the users or people that never were in the market before. Like those are one of the things that DeepN does. It's the people that have a hive map or cam on their ca- on, on their car, on their dash cam. Um, they never consider themselves to be in like the data business, but you know, now they're, they, they are and collectively everyone is con- contributing to something that becomes a competitor to say like a Google or, um, or other kind of, uh, mapping services. So I think that, you know, that's one of the things that Pith shares in common with this. And I love that category of things that break up monopolies that give people the, um, ownership of their own data. So I would be highly encouraged to see that continue with stuff like Hive Mapper. Um, I'd love to see some collaboration with Pith in, in in that sort of a data in the future, or just for the two to exist and you know have different types of data that they're contributing to the to blockchains and um, making all kinds of things available. When when the Web two world has become so extractive, um, it's just you know kind of killed a lot of the innovation. You want to make these things boring again. Like that's yeah. that's one of the ideas around Pith is like make finance boring again so that cool shit can be developed. I don't know. We need more meme coins, man. It's all about the <laughs> it's all about the degens. Okay, I, I have to ask you about Chainlink a little bit and go to market because most mm-hmm. people, when they think of oracles, they know Pith, they know Chainlink. I think Chainlink was around much longer than Pith was. Um, yeah, Pith has kind of taken the world by storm. So, what do you think the secret was for Pith? And don't hold back. You know, let out some jabs if you need to. <laughs> I just want to know, like, what was the core advantage? I mean, Chainlink still has a massive FDV. I'm sure they're doing really well, but I would say Pith has definitely stolen the narrative. Yeah, so Chainlink decided to um, solve that problem using um, kind of these automation nodes, right? They solved the problem of getting data on chain. And I think the thing that the, the core assumption that they got wrong was that all the world's information was on the internet and it doesn't matter how fast you get it on there as long as it's updated in a couple of seconds. I think that that's where they sort of stumbled. Um, the product that is their, like their core product on the Oracle space, by the way, they do other stuff that's not just this, then I consider them more of a messaging bridge or a messaging layer. But I'm talking specifically in this case about like what they do in the Oracle um, realms. But basically, you can think about them as as a protocol says, hey, I want some automation nodes to go out and fetch me the price of Bitcoin from CoinGecko. Um, And you know what? Do it every 50 basis points or like, you know, once a day. And here's the gas money to go do it. And like Chainlink will have somebody from like Chainlink Labs or sales that goes out and says, cool, yep, well, we can run that job for you. How many validators would you like to have or have 10? So they know that there's, you know, there's enough redundancy. So one's wrong or one goes down, like we've got a bunch of others. And they do it and they run it for a certain person or a certain company uh, on a certain blockchain. And then they do this a bunch of times. And when you like zoom out to like 60,000 foot view, you're like, wow, Chainlink has instances of these automation jobs run on a bunch of different blockchains for a bunch of different symbols. That doesn't mean that there's any scalability there. It's just like a fact, like, okay, they've had a lot of success as a enterprise um, kind of sales company to run automation jobs for various companies or various protocols. Whereas what Pith was building is something that can be used by everyone permissionlessly. Whenever a symbol is added to Pith, it's deployed on all 50 blockchains. So there's 400 symbols. Everyone has the exact same as, a, access. On the Chainlink side, it's like if you looked at a feed that was updating once a day for like the ETH price on, or let's, let's pick something a little bit different. Let's say like the Lido price on base and you're running a protocol over on Arbitrum, th- the fact that there's this feed running on base does absolutely nothing for you. And if you mm-hmm. want any different characteristics, even if you're on base, you say, hey, you know what? Rather than have it run every 24 hours, run every 12 hours, you still have to contact sales and you have to go and do um, something to get this automation job run di- run differently for you. And so they're very different setups, right? Like there's over like 600 people that work at Chainlink because they're a services company that does all these enterprise services. Pith is a protocol that is designed to have the economics built. Different people contribute to the, the protocol. It's decentralized, it's completely permissionless to use. 
Um, and it's, it's incentivizing the truth at T0. And so this is where I say that they had this assumption where all the world's information was on the internet and it wasn't necessarily all that time sensitive. You can look and see that their offering is designed like anything you want, you can, you can kind of go and grab that's on the internet. Um, could be weather, could be sports. Um, but they don't have this prioritization on how do you get the fastest data on. The people that contributed to building PIP all worked at high frequency trading firms that understood that that $7 billion that's extracted from exchanges in selling financial market data, you can get all the world's financial market data after about 15 minutes for free. So all of the value is somewhere between time of zero and 15 minutes. And you probably would have guessed it. The most of the value is the closest you get to T0. And so the idea for PIP was, why don't you try and optimize for this tiny little sliver where the data is super, super valuable and forget about the rest of the stuff, right? And just get that right. And then if we need to add in, you know, sports data or weather data over time and it becomes super valuable, great. But focus on the most valuable data in the world today and get it so that the most valuable component of that is being brought on chain. Incentivize people so that there's one specific blockchain developed just for this and then be able to expand to other things. That's a really good answer. Hopefully I don't get the Link Marines coming for you because they are a vicious but fun group. <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs> it did remind me a tiny bit as well about uh, just to show the importance of latency of data and crypto. Crypto Twitter is a very big thing. And one reason for that is because there's constant updates. People, especially DGENs who are trading all the time, are looking for some alpha, right? Well, you can either see like today, even when we had the outage with Solana, all those updates were happening live on Twitter. Like that latency was so important versus there are articles coming out all the time, but those are slightly delayed because you're dealing with people that are doing tweets like they can make in five minutes versus something that takes like 40 minutes to write. But that information asymmetry is so important for anyone that needs to act on it. And that's kind of what you're talking about with Pith is that latency of information is really valuable. And I think everyone in crypto actually sees that day to day on Twitter. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, last question before we wrap up. You see the data live probably daily with Pith. And what I mean by that is how many chains are integrated with Pith, how many applications are integrated with Pith. I want to know which ecosystem you're looking at right now. And you're like, that's some interesting traction happening. And it, let's not say Solana. I'm not going to allow you to say Solana because that's what the show <laughs> mostly covers. So whether it's not Solana, let's just say it could be Base, it could be an L2, it could be Sui. Yeah, just like to get your insights. Yeah, it's a tough one because we are on 50. And... Um, and they are sort of all snowflakes. Um, so there are there are like different ecosystems, different different protocols that you work with on each one, and you learn to love certain elements of them. So You're they're like all picking a of, favorite child right now. <laughs> it sort of feels like picking a favorite child. Um, so I'm going to do a total cop out thing, and I'm going to like not pick your one, but I'm going to tell you some of the things that I like about the different ecosystems. Okay. So even though you told me I can't say something nice about Solana, Solana in like the, the coding environment, um, Jan, our CTO at Dora Labs has been incredibly complimentary after working with different ecosystems that it is, it is actually great. And probably the best thing that Solana has ever done is to market how hard it is to code there. And in reality, it's not nearly as bad. And so that creates this perception like, wow, I'm actually probably better than I thought I was, where I think a lot of other ecosystems probably get this wrong. They're like, it's super easy to come code and fill in the blanks. And then it's like actually really difficult. And uh, then you just start to like be a little bit annoyed, like, ah, you know, maybe I'm not so good. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so I would say that's that's one of the, the, the super strengths of Solana. Um, Sui Optos, um, I think, have really high performance uh, environments and they're really customizable which has been great. Um, those have the highest updates that are pulling requests on. It ends up being a lot of the requests that are basically used to incentivize developers to come and sh and see how cheap the ecosystem is. Um, it's really impressive. They The teams on, on both of those, like the core development teams, are really good at shaving off time um, and being able to save compute. So I think that um, those are great. There, there, there's not tons of documentation yet because Move is written from the ground up. So, you know, that's sort of the, one of the trade-offs. And then EVM has got all of the mind share for the most part on um, kind of the first generation. And it just ends up being a lot of people's entrance into development. So there's been a lot of stuff that's been exciting um, seeing the growth on L2s. Um, Pith has not had a huge uh, penetration on ETH L1 yet because it's um, been optimized for high throughput chains, but on Optimism um, and Arbitrum, there's been you know a lot of cool development. 
Um, Monad is one that you know has similar DNA to some of the people at Pith, where they're just hardcore systems engineers who know how to strip out a lot of the excess, similar to like the Fire Dancer team for for Solana. Um, and so I think that some of the stuff that they've done in terms of the design um, has really been incredible to make it really high performant. All right, that was a that was a good answer because you're gonna have a lot political, of people, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have a lot of people from di different ecosystems be happy about it. Actually, I think that was really informative. So I'm glad to get your perspective on multiple environments. But uh, Mike, thanks so much for coming on today. I think uh, I think a lot of people actually know what Pith is, even though it is on the infra layer. Whether that's because of the airdrop or because you're across so many different chains, that is very unique about you guys. But I think it's also one of the reasons why it's so exciting. And oracles in general are a linchpin of crypto, especially for, for anyone that believes that real world assets become more and more of a thing. So Mike, thanks for coming on and just keep killing it. Thanks so much, Garrett. I enjoyed it. Yep. We'll see you next time. All right. I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is Blockworks' biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. You get 10% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed10 when you sign up. All right. I'll see you there. And I'll see you next time on Lightspeed.